Good afternoon and welcome to the Centre for the Study of Co-ops uh, November seminar. My name is Audra Kruger and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here and introduce our guest speaker today. Um, I'll be facilitating the question period after as well. Um, and I'd also like to uh, welcome our viewers from their homes and offices and comfy spots around the world. Um, this will be uh, live streamed, um, so it's available on uh, the internet today. This presentation will also be recorded and it will be available in a couple of weeks on our website. You will also see that there's two names here. So this is a collaboration between our guest speaker today, Peter Couchman, and Murray Fulton. I'll ask Murray to wave. There he is. Um, for those of you that don't know him, he's on sabbatical this year from his directorship and will re re be returning in July, I believe. Um, and he is also the uh, chair in cooperative governance. So now on to the good stuff, Peter. Um, Peter Couchman is the chief executive of the Plunkett Foundation based in the UK. Um, the Plunkett Foundation was created by cooperative pioneer Sir Horace Plunkett. The foundation empowers rural communities to solve their problems through the creation of community cooperatives. The Plunkett Foundation was awarded the Rochdale Pioneers Award in 2013, the international cooperative movement's highest honour. The Plunkett Foundation has been working with the Centre for the Study of Cooperatives and Federated Cooperatives Limited on a project that's looking at how to support co-op development in rural and First Nations communities. So welcome, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here, and also hi to everybody online as well. Um, what we're going to look at today is something that we came across almost by accident, but actually found to be quite frightening, and perhaps something that those who care about cops should think about. The starting point for this was that as an international movement, Cooperatives every so often gather together, uh, particularly once every two years, the International Cooperative Alliance hold its Congress, uh, and now also firmly established in Quebec is every other year, the International Summit is held there. And when co-ops come together, they celebrate who they are, what they are, and what they stand for. They actually celebrate the commercial success they've achieved in that time since they gathered. But also equally, they celebrate the impacts that they've had um, and the difference they've made to people's lives. And all these things are, are things that we can be tremendously proud of. Um, and it's absolutely right they should actually learn from each other what is working, what's taking them forward, what has made them stronger in that time. But there's something they tend not to speak about, and that's what today's presentation is about. Uh, this is a presentation we actually developed for the International Copy of Alliance to actually at their last gathering a few weeks ago in Turkey. Because what they tend not to mention is that every time there's a gathering, or many times that there's a gathering, one or two aren't there. That in, the, in between those gatherings, some very large cooperatives will have hit difficulties, and some of them won't have survived. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That actually happens in, in the mainstream world as well. It happens in the private sector. Um, but what we wanted to do was to explore the idea, it's not so much that there, there has been failure, but the fact there's actually a failure that people don't talk about. We talk about the success, but no space was being given to actually say, what can we learn when things go wrong? So this was an issue that simply wasn't being discussed in cooperative circles, or, or as we put it in, in the paper, uh, the fact that it wasn't so much the elephant in the room, what we were failing to talk about was the elephant that was no longer in the room, very large-scale co-ops that simply weren't there any longer. And what could we learn about them? The starting point for this paper really brings together two experiences. We had the excellent work done by Murray uh, and the centre here that looked at the, the collapse of the Canadian wheat pools. Uh, so Saskatchewan wheat pools, all right. <laughs> and a uh, quick, quick correction from the audience. Uh, Saskatchewan wheat pool. And also... What we then explored that with is alongside that the major difficulties that Coptive Group in the UK went through. And the frightening part was that different businesses, different sectors, different cultures, but in actual fact, the path towards their failure was remarkably similar. So that started to raise some questions. Was there something in common that we were seeing here? What we then started to look at was the fact that actually in fact, these weren't alone as, as cooperative failures. So if we actually looked at, for instance, the failure of French retail co-ops, Austrian banking, Australian cooperative banking, 
German Coptive retailing, Canadian Coptive wholesaling, Belgian Coptive retailing, British Coptive dairying, Austrian retailing, to name but a few, we not only saw a number of significant failures, what we started to see was something even more frightening than that. And that was a repeating pattern. That each of these failures was both unique to where they were, but actually also seemed to have some common factors involved in that. And maybe if we actually wanted to address that, and maybe if we actually wanted to stop that happening again, there were some learnings to be had there. Perhaps actually just simply standing around failing to talk about this was actually weakening our movement. And far from looking for failures as a negative, understanding it could make us even stronger. So what we started to explore was what are the common factors behind these failures um, and how can we use those warning signs to try to um, cr create a, a future that's more positive. The first thing to say is that they don't always end in the same way when they fail. Some will collapse completely, some will be demutualized, carrying on within the private sector, while others will survive in a reduced form. Yet in most cases, the main thing is a significant loss of member value that's been built up over generations. For instance, that the challenges at Coptive Group in the UK, although it has now survived uh, and is now into its recovery one there, it lost two and a half billion pounds of member share capital value in going through that process. And time and time again here, what we've seen is actually the sheer value being lost is, is not only in incredibly ch challenging, but also it has taken generations to build that up with it, and many cases won't be coming back. So what we decided to do was say, well, so what is this path that we see going through there? Which one, when we apply it to each model, are we seeing being repeated? And what we ended up with was five stages uh, that we identified. And what we're going to do is go to, we're going to work backwards through those stages. As Steve Jobs put it, you can't connect the dots looking forward. So we're going to start with catastrophe and work out with what were the decisions that got us there. So five factors. If we can actually avoid these, we save ourselves billions of dollars. So let's have a go. First factor, when we actually see the collapse, these don't go gentle into that good night. They actually end up with a very major event normally before their final collapse, almost a kind of last gasp of breath, and um, putting off something that's actually seen inevitable by the outside, but actually is often portrayed very difficult, differently. What we'll see is acquisitions, mergers, restructures, um, and they'll take many different forms, but the common factor is they'll actually be portrayed as something that's bold and groundbreaking by management at the time. They'll actually talk about a language about this is how we're going to show other cops how it's done. You know, they really just don't get this, but we're going to actually show how this works. People are going to learn from what we're about to do now. They'll also have a language about their, their members themselves perhaps often haven't understood what's going on here. But never mind, we're doing it for their good. This is going to be how we're going to get through there. Um, so it's that big, bold attempt that finally brings them down. Sometimes straight away, sometimes leaving them so wounded, it takes time to carry on there. But it's this final attempt to actually create something special that really is, is, the, is the challenge in there. But we also have to ask ourselves another question, and that's why we need the five phases. These tactics as a tactic for business aren't unique. We see successful mergers. We see successful acquisitions. We see successful restructures. Why are these different, and why are they doomed to failure? What we said there is actually it's not so much the activity itself, it's actually the mindset that got us there, which is the fourth factor. So the fourth factor is that of overconfidence. And here, I think, was the real insight uh, with the paper produced by the centre here, uh, looking at the wheat pool example. I'm actually saying that the, the challenge in this one is the thinking going on in the minds of the managers within those cooperatives at the time. That the managers exhibit excessive pride and self-confidence in what they're trying to do, um, and this actually leads to that failure. In the paper, it talks about that this means that the CEOs have an overwhelming presumption that their high valuation of a takeover target is correct, even when it's not. 
CEOs will tend to overpay for these acquisitions, and so the investments will often be unsuccessful. So this fourth factor says we have a management team in place in these cooperatives who are actually overvaluing anything they're trying to acquire and underestimating the challenge of any the, the, str the strength of any activity they're trying to undertake. They simply have believed in themselves too much, and therefore that's at the price of their cooperative. Um, and that, that is seen just, just too many times. They believe they can turn it around. The rest of them can't. What we'll also tend to see in those failures um, is a culture um, that's visible that actually talks about how their superiority in thinking is to be valued. Um, thus, anyone that actually tries to challenge within that culture is simply dismissed as really being behind the times and not with it within there. So that mindset within management is the thing that brings this down. Undertaking activities that, quite frankly, doom to failure if you know, unless you can actually take into account that confidence. <laughs> So how do you actually get to the situation where you can actually make decisions that can wipe off billions simply through your own overconfidence within a corporate structure? Well, the simple answer is it really is the lack of board oversight. But the fact is not only were they overconfident, many of us can have that, but they were overconfident without challenge. What we actually saw there in time and time again was a board that failed to actually ask the right questions of management that we actually see a board that actually um, is basically taken into this one, that actually feels it has to support its management to undertake activities. I can remember sort of, uh, you know, speaking with one director from a major co-op that's you know, on that list of failure. And I said, yeah, I can't understand why you're planning this acquisition. This seems to go against everything the market wants to, is doing, and yet you're pursuing that one. And the simple answer was, yes, I don't understand it either. Now, that's pretty terrifying, isn't it? Yeah, one thing to think you've got it and to find out afterwards you've got it wrong, but to actually sit in a board and not even understand the arguments that manager put to you to go forwards is terrifying. So therefore, this lack of board oversight, this third stage within it, really is one that is terrifying to it. Uh, and again, in, in the paper, they talk about how the relationship between CEO hubris and acquisition premium is greater when board vigilance is lacking, i.e., the less oversight by the board, the greater the overpayment. So management are taking proposals to the board where they have significantly overestimated the value and it's still going through, or they're taking major activities to the board where they've significantly underestimated the challenge and still it's going through uh, within there. So what has happened here is that the boards in those found co-ops have developed a relationship with their management which really doesn't give a clear values base for the organisation. It doesn't give a clear strategic direction um, that's actually linked to the needs of the members and there certainly isn't proper evaluation of acquisitions, acqu mergers and investments, etc. So we actually end up not only with a management overestimating, we've now got a board the only real people that can call them to account failing to do so within there. And again, we'd say this was the common factor we're seeing, a board that simply wasn't getting it in there. For instance, in the UK, Lord Miners, who carried out a review of the failings of Coptive Group, uh, was scathing of the quality of his board system. He said, it places individuals who do not possess the requisite skills and experience into positions where their lack of understanding prevents them from exercising the necessary oversight of the executive. And I think you know, the key bit there is that necessary oversight of the executive. It applies to any board, certainly for a cooperative board. Now, it would be easy to actually describe this as a governance failure, because clearly, in many ways, it is. But I think the important part that I'll argue here is actually it's a failure of governance culture that many of these cooperatives that failed actually had very significant investment in governance systems, but actually failed to challenge themselves when the culture didn't use those systems. They all had the processes there that could have prevented this, but their culture meant it wasn't seen to be the done thing to actually trigger those processes, to actually call out a management valuation or, or whatever. Um, so to me, it's this failure of directors to actually exercise the proper levels of oversight that is the core of that. So how do we get to this situation then where we've actually got managers overestimating, uh, underestimating challenges, overvaluing, and the board failing to have oversight? 
Well, being pretty brutal, I think it's important with this, this loss to actually do that, we get on to the second factor. And that is we have to face the fact that probably the wrong people were actually there making those decisions. And wrong in two ways. Put simply, we've got board members who failed to understand their role in the cooperative, appointing managers who have a thinly concealed contempt for cooperative values. Um, recent failures have resulted in a greater discussion about the competence of elected representatives. Um, certainly within the UK, this is now a major debate going on there with a very new system the cooperative group attempting to overcome its challenges. And whilst I think it's, you know, it's a very positive thing to actually have these debates around competence, uh, the reality is that I think competence is simply defined as pure business competence is one of the challenges that we, we have for looking forward to the future. To me, I'm actually passionate about the idea we need competent boards, but I think we need competence that actually not only has commercial acumen, but also understanding of cooperative values and also understanding of the social mission of the cooperative that people are involved with. To me, competence needs to be a value if we are to avoid these issues for the future. A board that merely sees competence as the ability to look the same as your competitors really won't unlock a cooperative advantage. I would also argue there's a real danger of actually not connecting with the needs of members as well. So I think let's have this debate about competence, but let's actually really start to, to challenge what's needed in the long run for a cooperative to be, be working in those ways. Now, it's very easy to point you know, fingers at the, the directors of failed co-ops, but far harder, I think, to come up with what is the selection process for getting there. I think it's very unlikely there's one single solution if you carry out this activity, we end up with competent board members. Undoubtedly, I think it's a, it's a mix. It's actually we need a more rigorous election process. Too many cooperative boards are simply elected by so-and-so appears to be a very nice person. So-and-so has been around a while uh, within there. Um, So-and-so actually will articulate very similar views to the rest of the people standing for election. I can remember sort of uh, one colleague involved in politics. He says, I always struggle with co-op elections because when my party is electing people, I read what everyone has said and I know exactly where they are on the political spectrum. I know which one, therefore, that I actually want to be supporting. When I read m the, the manifestos in co-op elections, I've got no idea what they really stand for. They all believe in co-ops. They all want to do well. So actually, the, the election literature isn't connecting me with them. Certainly, I'd also argue that actually we need far greater access to cooperative education. There are still far too few opportunities for members to actually genuinely learn and to understand uh, co the role of cooperatives in life. Uh, what the great co-op educator Joe Reeves called to, to understand the profound implications of cooperation. Uh, the reality is, I think, in recent years, we've seen a decrease in the, in the importance of cooperative education in the eyes of many, which I think is part of this problem. Uh, because you know, many years ago, lay members had a, a great opportunity for actually learning and understanding that role. Now, often, that work isn't beginning until they've actually be already got onto the board. Um, so for me, if you actually want to invest in the right people coming forwards, you actually need to invest in people full stop and help people to understand and to develop there. We also, I think, need to challenge ourselves to draw from a wider pool of members. Uh, the reality is that you know, most co-op democracy is based around people who've been there a while going for this. By and large, therefore, you actually tend to get the same groupings culturally, etc., beyond engaged there. How do we actually challenge a co-op to make sure that it's a those standing for election, represent the broad views of society that they're part of rather than a narrow grouping uh, within there. And also I think the, we actually, this also argues for a stronger support once elected uh, within their co-op as well. So much can be done. I think it's very easy to say, well, it's obviously it's the fault of the co-op system. I think, again, it's actually how we've invested in, in making sure that when someone is on a board, they know what they should be doing. I think the same can also be said of the recruitment of managers. Um, directors who espouse cooperative values seem all too willing to appoint people who don't um, and, and won't demonstrate little appetite for building solutions to the cooperative identity of their organisation. And you see this time and time again, the language within those failures. There was a contempt for actually what cooperatives stood for, that cooperatives were seen as the problem rather than actually part of the solution in there. One of the things I think is quite tempting when you see these failures is to actually say, well, it's the fault of outsiders that they came in and they destroyed our co-op. 
The reality is the data doesn't back that up. That within those failures, yes, there were examples of people who came in from mainstream corporations and actually failed to understand their co-op and simply tried to act the same and failed there. But there are equal numbers within that there actually have been in that organisation for 30 years. That people actually had strong cooperative backgrounds instead of having worked there, but actually nevertheless had no commitment to what they'd experienced there. So I don't think it's an outsider-insider issue. It's actually it's people who choose to work through their cooperative identity and people um, who don't. So what gets us to that stage where the wrong people are there? Well, we go back then uh, to the first factor, uh, which to me, what we see a language evolving very early on is that cooperation is seen as a problem, not as a solution. Um, the earliest signs of this one, we just see a language gently creeping in, which is we must look like and act like the same as our competitors within the, within the private sector, that somehow our cultural identity is a burden um, rather than actually a source of pride. Um, the natural fact, um, there's a cynicism about the democracy and a cynicism about member engagement. What do they know about what this co-op needs? We're here to give it to them um, for that. And also often a, a contempt for part of the past, a contempt for the co-op history and for the roots of the organisation. That's not to say that the successful simply look backwards, the successful actually use their cooperative roots to actually create a future within there. But all too often there's a, almost a feeling of shame uh, within that. I can remember in my history year once being summoned to a, uh, to a chief executive's office who said, yeah, it, very exciting times for us. He says, you know, next year is the centenary of our co-op and we're really going to, to go for this. Oh, yeah, this is great. Yeah, oh, absolutely, so of course we're going to. He says, yeah, there's only one thing I would ask during our centenary and that is, can you not mention the past? <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> that, that was the remit. Uh, it wasn't the best of years. Uh, <laughs> but, but that, is, I think, is an attitude within that. Um, this idea that somehow what had gone on before was irrelevant, that the only way you actually create a cooperative for the future is ignoring what has gone on before, rather than actually realising what you have is a richness of a DNA in, inside that co-op. If you build on and make relevant to the modern day, becomes a source of pride and can help you take things forwards in there. Um, so therefore, in many ways, this simply attitude that is dismissive of that co-op one there is the first sign. To me, this really is the canary in a coal mine. When you start seeing people talking like that in a co-op, you know that problems are coming, and they've come all too often. And I, yeah, all too often it's been dismissed of, oh, well, of course, they're just telling it like it is, and you know, maybe they, we should have some sympathy with that position, etc. The reality is this is when it tends to go wrong, that actually when people start to not value what they've got and believe they know better, any organisation will start to fail, but a cooperative that actually relies on the collective knowledge and wisdom of its members to go forward, that's doubly so. So that's the path. Five steps, starting simply with not valuing what you've got, through to those final explosions of, of trying to actually survive, has wiped off billions of dollars from this movement. It's taken you know, great historic institutions either out of the system or, or left weakened. And the most frustrating part of that is it doesn't have to happen. And if we actually had the right culture to actually not only spot those early warning signs, but to take action, then maybe there's a chance in there. So what do we see those early warning signs as being? Well, in many ways, we, I think we've touched on a number of them. But let's actually just you know, spell them out. If you see these things, then maybe there's something to be looked at within there. How we put it is, it's a cooperative that falls silent on its cooperative identity and its need to be engaged with its members. It's where a board exhibit little understanding of the nature of the cooperative business that they're actually um, supposedly leading. When we actually see managers appointed, either externally or internally, who've no interest or belief in the cooperative model, and are quite happy to articulate that, uh, often very publicly. A board which is unable to explain how the major change it's pursuing will actually add value to the members. Um, all too often, particularly on the acquisition front, you're actually acquiring things well outside the interest of members, but nevertheless, somehow you're supposed to be doing it um, for the members. 
that when we see a management conducting mergers, acquisitions and investments which are to the outside world lacking clarity, um, business logic um, or even actually have, seem to appear to have much higher valuations than the market can actually understand why they're pursuing there. What well, often this is, is marked alongside is the shift in power and authority in the organisation to a very small group within that cooperative, a group that's increasingly isolated from both the membership um, and also the employees, both senior and junior. There becomes almost sort of a cult that says, this is the only true path, this organisation. Anyone that challenges this really hasn't got it, but we're actually going to act in everybody's interest and save this. But the reality is, the biggest warning sign is that when it's when people are actually acting in a way that quite clearly actually isn't in the interest of their cooperative. They're really not driven by actually meeting member need, but actually by the survival of their own positions and their own interests within there. It's never too late to act. All of those could be dealt with. But it can only happen if we actually have a culture, both within a cooperative but also within the cooperative movement that actually challenges these positions. All too often as a movement which is you know, passionately committed to cooperation between cooperatives, the one thing we're actually not willing to do is to actually challenge other co-ops that are starting to go along this path. It's simply seen as not the done thing to do. But maybe if it actually takes billions of dollars out of our sector, maybe the time has come that we should be challenging in there. Maybe we should be being very open when we actually see people starting along those paths. Because the reality is that the quicker you act on this, the greater the chance of survival, the less the loss of value. And so, therefore, the damage to the cooperative movement of another loss isn't just the finance, it's also actually the reputation of this movement and the chance to actually build something stronger. It's not simply that co-op that went down, it's all those that were connected to it. It's those communities that actually believed once in cooperation and now that those views are challenged in there. It's the people whose livelihoods were connected within that one and lost that. And it's the members that actually thought they owned a co-op but in actual fact saw it taken from them. So to me, saving a co-op is everybody's business. And understanding those five stages and actually challenging is something that every person that cares about co-op should do. So that's our, our paper within there. Um, you're, you're very welcome to sort of um, download our, um, our final one there, if you'd like to. Um, but I think this is something that we should all be exploring uh, and looking forward to our discussions on that. So thank you very much. So I'll take some questions from the audience now. Does anybody have any? Oh, I'm just going to... Oh, I'll just go to Dion first. Thank you, Peter uh, and Marie. Very, very interesting uh, paper. Um, I, you know, I think, uh, I, you know, I, I can, m I agree with all of the factors, uh, except when you come back to number one. The one thing I'll just um, s challenge you a little bit on there is, I don't necessarily think that that is. Um, when you look at all co-op failures, that it, it, that that's necessarily that that first factor is is the only way to think about it is seeing cooperation as the problem i also think there are co-ops big co-ops that fail um, because they actually don't recognize um, the business element so i think if you think about co-op atlantic one of the reasons that that shook the movement so much was because people were saying i mean this was a co-op that had the principles on their wall i mean people really i think and and i mean we can argue that maybe there were other things that we don't know as much about going on in terms of a thinly concealed contempt of cooperative values but i think that factor one actually is both it's actually um, seeing cooperation as the problem and or seeing um, you know, being able to compete in, hi in highly dynamic and changing industries and environments and not recognizing that actually a co-op also needs to be an efficient business is, is part of that problem as well. And I think, I think then you can still follow through all the other factors, but I think factor one has to take into account a little bit both, um, both of those issues. But I know, I, you might disagree. I wouldn't disagree, but actually I don't see them as separate within there. Yeah, to me, yeah, one of the challenges of that co-op Atlantic bit, yes, they had the co-op values as a stone tablet on the wall, but were they actually thinking through what that meant in the modern world? So to me, it's actually the challenge is actually saying that we need to survive in this marketplace, which is a highly challenging marketplace, by being a cooperative. 
Um, so to me, those who actually just say, therefore, this justifies taking actions which aren't of interest to the co-op are actually on this path. Uh, but equally, those who actually are thinking through, well, we know we're a co-op, but we can just carry on as we normally are. We don't have to adapt, are also not really believing in the co-op position. You know, to me, co-ops are at their best when they're constantly innovating because of their members. So I think you know, and, and there's been sort of a, a great new paper on Co-op Atlantic here. But for me, I'd love to take apart some of the initiatives, some of the bits that were the ones that led on to the Big Bang. Because to me, it was actually acting in a marketplace in a way you'd have to say, how does that actually work for the members? What, have we actually got the member needs at the root of this? So I think it's about great co-ops succeed in modern markets because they're cooperative. And if you don't believe in that one, then you start taking business actions that lend to it. So, so I don't see it as an either or in that one. But absolutely, if you can't actually understand a co-op in a way that actually gives you market advantage, then you probably need to get out of the way and let somebody else c can do within there. So I think it's, a, it's an important one, but absolutely, the, a belief in cooperation should never be an excuse for actually not delivering great, great service to members and a positioning in the marketplace that is uniquely cooperative. Okay, do we have any other questions here? All right, thank you. Um, so I'd be interested in some comments around education, mm -hmm. um, because you're right when you say, you know, education is really the foundation of understanding. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that in, in times past, people understood because, you know, essentially co-ops were developed out of needs. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot more needs in society at that time. And so people kind of grew up understanding what a co-op was. Mm -hmm. We don't have those needs really in today's society right. as we did in the past. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like we've lost that um, intuitive, I guess, uh, feeling of co-ops. And so how do we regain that? What will we do? You know, what do we need to do as far as education to bring mm -hmm. the uh, the newer generations, I guess, up mm -hmm. to that that same level? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you hit on a big problem, and the simple answer, yeah, in terms of what does it take, it, it's an awful lot. You know, this is a big, big challenge that we face, and it's a challenge that cooperatives around the world face. I just don't go to a country that hasn't actually got that challenge. Uh, so I think you, you, we're not going to solve that in one single initiative and one single idea there. Uh, but I think there's several in there. The first one is actually, I think, admitting that as a movement, we can often be incredibly insular. We will actually you know, go to the big co-op events and tell each other how great we are, but actually, is it being heard out there? Um, so the first one is to actually see co-ops actually getting out there and telling that cooperative story. Um, and I think at the moment, we face a major challenge in cooperative communication around the world. That by and large, the cooperative communication that's going out there isn't about the cooperative difference, it's actually about my co-op is successful. You know, that actually if you look at the percentage of it, the bulk of it is around, we are very big, although normally actually not quite as big as the rest of the market, so therefore it doesn't actually impress the outside world there. Uh, we're very successful, uh, we do some nice things that actually look remarkably similar to what our competitors do. Um, so actually getting that wrong rather than actually telling the cooperative story. And there are good examples out of that happening, but there's not enough of them. Um, so I think a concerted effort by the movement to actually explain what it's doing. Um, the classic bit for me was the one we touched on earlier on, you know, the Carp Atlantic stone on the wall. Well, anyone can read the Carp values and say they're great, but if it's not brought to life for you, what do you do? Uh, certainly one, one Carp I work with, we used to have a model we called VIA, uh, which said, well, it's great that we've got the values and we're very, very proud of those. But if the, we want to connect to the outside world, we need to say which issues do we today deal with that actually bring those values to life. It's not enough to say, well, actually, in fact, in the 19th century, we were solving access to food as an issue. What is it we're going to do now to actually bring those values to life? And then what are the actions we have to take to actually make sure that people are actually seeing us doing that? When they see us doing it, they then ask the question, why are you doing it? And you get the chance to tell the cop's story. So I think there's a significant challenge out there. Uh, the International Carp Alliance uh, recently launched a very exciting uh, new communication initiative called What If? We're actually just trying to get cops talking about the changes they're going to make in the world, the difference it can make to people's lives, rather than talking about it as, as corporate entities. So I think we've got that challenge in there. But then, once you're actually in your co-op, what is going on in member education there? Uh, the reality, I think, in many cases is not enough in there. How are we actually making our members understand and feel a pride in their movement? 
how we're making our members understand the role that they can play in helping to shape that as well. Uh, the reality is if we go back to the, the roots of, of most co-op movements, we'll see significant investment in education. You know, the Rochdale pioneers broke the law to actually put money into educating their members when they were first formed within there. Robert Owen talked about education you know, as being the primary model uh, even before then. Uh, whereas nowadays, we don't tend to do that. It just becomes a corporate communication. Uh, so I think the challenge is reinventing corporate ed education for the modern age uh, within there. So I think there's lots to be done within there at all levels in the organisation. If we're actually not making that case, it becomes too easy on this path for someone to actually start talking about an alternative. Um, so actually, let's actually get a positive out there so people are challenging in there. Uh, and that, to me, doesn't start in the corporate head office of these larger co-ops. It actually starts in the grassroots. It actually starts when you, when you go shopping or when you experience the service. Are you experiencing those messages and that connection there? So I think if we want to do this, investing in actually getting our message across is a great way of not going down this path. And I think when we see that, we see a lot of good in it. We just don't see enough of it out there with, with too many co-ops. Uh, thank you. Uh, when it comes to the topic when big groups fail, I have a question. I think, is it possible that big itself is a problem? I mean, when it's getting bigger, it's very hard to coordinate between the interests of members. Mm -hmm. So is this a natural rule or rule, or do you think it's a, it's a best uh, constraint or boundary for the expanding of co-ops? I mean, mm -hmm. um, what the managers should decide to 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 uh, focus the, the interest in their own community or is, or to expand. Mm. I, I think it's, it's a whole seminar in itself that one, um, but it's a, it's a really important point there. I think it's very tempting to say big co-ops can't succeed, but the reality is there are many great ones around the world. You know, starting from where we are are here in Saskatchewan and, and working outwards within there. And so I don't think just being big per se causes a failure. Um, in many ways, you know, big gives lots of opportunity, but it does bring communications challenges with it. It does actually make it harder to stay connected to your members. It does stay harder to actually get their views coming through. It becomes harder to actually make sure you've got a management team that's genuinely connected. So I think just as there are benefits of size, there are challenges of size. And I think when you see the ones that are succeeding, they're focusing on those challenges. They're actually saying we can't take it for granted just because we came from something very small. Therefore, we're going to, yeah, we're, we're always going to be okay on that one. Um, so I think it's about actually realizing the weaknesses of size and actually focusing on them, whereas all too often our language is simply talking about scale and, and, the, and the benefits of size within there. Um, so I don't, I don't think it means that, therefore, a large co-op is doomed to failure and should never be allowed to, to get them in the first place. I think it's about understanding the management and the cognitive management challenges within that are very, very significant. Um, but yeah, certainly uh, in, in some of the boardrooms that I've been within there, there just has been no mechanism for the member voice to get in there. Um, no mechanism for people to actually be sharing the, their ideas, their knowledge, etc. within that. So I think you have to start by saying, if we're a large co-op, the reality is, unless we do something about it, we're cut off from the day to day. We're actually not hearing what's happening on the shop floors, we're not hearing the voice of members. So how are we going to go about doing that? You know, certainly one of the consumer co-ops that I yet worked with, I knew we were making progress when we got to the stage of whenever a paper went into the board for action, the first question you'd get if you hadn't already dealt with it was, what does the data from member research show on what the members think of this? Um, so they made sure that voice was being heard in the boardroom. Um, so I think, yeah, ab yeah, absolutely, it's not an easy one, but it can be dealt with if this cop says the root to our success is our cooperative identity and we're going to keep going on there. But I think it'll be a constant challenge when you need to keep coming back to. Uh, but, yeah, this isn't an attempt at all to say big co-op's bad thing. Quite the opposite. It's actually saying these are so important to our movement that it's worth the effort to make sure that, that they carry on to develop and thrive, etc. There's two paths to be taken here. Let's stop them going down one. But yeah, believe me, if, if you're in a big co-op, you're going to have to constantly keep revisiting that one and learning as you go. Any other questions? No. 
Uh, growing up in this province, I was absolutely fascinated by this wonderful co-op called the Saskatchewan Wheat Pool. Mm -hmm. And looking at it, at their amazing success of having every community involved, mm -hmm. uh, education, all the good things, and then what happened. So this is a very timely topic for us now. The only thing is we could have used it 40 years ago. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now, would you comment on one thing? It seems to me, especially your, mm -hmm. your uh, point number three on education mm -hmm. and uh, board members unable to provide the proper, proper oversight. Mm -hmm. And I can see being able to educate board members and proper oversight in the kind of business you're doing, mm -hmm. but then taking that leap mm -hmm. to with globalization, mm -hmm. I think that's where our pr problem was. Mm. Just please elaborate. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's the worry, as you say, if we went back 40 years, we could have done this. Our worry is it's not that we, if 40 years ago we could have solved it, it's actually fact we're making the same mistakes today. You know, the reality is I think if actually the people in the cooperative group board in the UK had actually been looking at what happened in the wheat pool, then maybe they could actually have pulled up far, fast enough to actually save that value there. So it's the fact of, yeah, we don't want the next generation saying, I wish you told us about this um, for it. In terms of what goes on in the boardroom there, um, I think that we really need some, some huge debate around this. Uh, and like, I, I sense there are two schools of thought emerging on this. Uh, one school of thought says we need to support our elective members far more. They actually need you know, far greater um, support and, and training in their role and development once they're in there. And if they're actually given that, then they can come through uh, and they can work. Uh, in fact, in fact, people seeing the, the, this is a significant role you're playing here will also start to attract th the people that can actually you know, feel, feel comfortable in those situations as well. The second school of thought that's emerging is actually saying the system needs to change. And so, for instance, we're seeing that within how Cooptive Group has chosen to come through its crisis uh, by abandoning the model of actually fat people working up through committees and then onto the board, but actually having a much smaller uh, board chosen entirely for its business competence. Um, so now they have one of actually, although anyone you can apply to, there's quite a rigorous vetting in, in their language for who can actually be seen to be suitable there. And although the member council endorses um, who's on there, in actual fact, is yeah, it's a chosen board and the members of a different route for actually challenging uh, within there. Um, I, think, I, I think both models can be made to work. They've both got their challenges. Um, the challenge, I think, on that former one is the one you touch on. If you actually start getting larger and larger, at what point do you have to say, I just don't know enough about this? In my experience, is one individual member, one part of that. I think that's where board oversight comes in of actually saying, well, actually, fact, if we can't actually run this thing, then maybe we shouldn't be running this thing. You know, if I can't actually drive a sports car, then maybe I should be in a basic car because that's what I feel comfortable driving uh, within there. So if, we're actually, uh, if expansion means we're unable to control the asset we're now responsible for, big question about whose interests are we acting in? How can we possibly be acting in the member interest if we can't actually look after the member interest? That's yeah, it's a brave conversation to be had of are we good enough to run what we're planning to do? Um, but I think on that second model there, you know, I do genuinely fear for how that can be applied of where you actually start to say, therefore, anyone with any cooperative competence isn't welcome here. And we have actually already seen that in that process. We've seen the rejection of people with massive cooperative knowledge and yet others who seem to fit the bill being allowed in that don't have that but don't actually seem to be bringing in much else within there. So I think the competence model is very, very new and shouldn't be rejected, but should be deeply challenged within there. Um, and the members should have clear sight about what processes are going on in there. Uh, but all it's about to me is about having uncomfortable conversations. It's about having collective uncomfortable conversations of is our ball good enough? Uh, but also individually, am I good enough on this board? Uh, because one thing you can be sure of in the world we're in today, that people taking up seats that actually aren't adding to, to making their cops stronger are helping to bring it down uh, within there. We can't have free riders on this. So, so I hope we, you know, the shocks we've had will get those conversations going, but they're not going to be easy ones to be, be had. So I think your point's a really important one. Thanks. We're coming to the end of our time. So um, I want to thank you, uh, Peter and Murray, for presenting a really complex um, subject in a very straightforward way. And I know that 
my, I could see the audience, their wheels were turning as they thought, am I that clown as I sit <laughs> on the board table <laughs> making terrible decisions because, you know, I ha no, not, no, not what to do correctly. So thank you very much. Um, and I know that anyone that's seen your earlier presentations would have heard you talk about Horace on his horse going from community to community. Um, we don't have uh, the ability to send you to every community, but we will have this video and hopefully people can get it to their boards. I know that the boards I'm involved in, I'm going to encourage them to watch it because I think there does need to be some courageous conversations at the board table and, and that's a hard thing to do. So hopefully you've started that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.